I think if I want to change China, I have to change the rural areas because the majority of the people live in rural areas. And if I want to change the rural areas, I have to start changing women. If I teach one woman, I teach the whole family and generations to come. Why? Because a woman usually once she gets married, she is the first teacher to her child or children. In the Declaration of Beijing, it says women's rights are human rights. This is important. And then my friend Xie Li Hua and I started a school for rural women. I think if you want to change people, you first have to change people's mindsets. So we have that school set up. So it means people who live in rural areas have to find their own jobs or they start something for themselves. We train female entrepreneurs because we want them to help others to get employed and they could be a good role model. And then because China is aging, so we train rural women to learn how to take care of the elderly. And then uh, China's family structure is also changing. It's very difficult for a young mother to live with either her parents or her in-laws. So we train nannies to take care of the young mothers. So the results of the training is that people have become more responsible. And our school is in Beijing. So I would like all the embassy people to come and visit our school. And I do hope, you know, delegations of women from Latin America would come to visit China and come to share your stories with us. I'm a change maker. I want to change. And why I wanted to become a local politician. I think that has a lot to do with my own life experience or life history. I was born in 1937, and then um, um, after the end of World War II, uh, the winners of the war, China, the United States, the Great Britain, France, and the Soviet Union, decided to send delegations to Tokyo, Japan, to occupy Japan. I, uh, when my parents told me that they would take me to Japan, I said, I'm not going with you because I hated them. But my parents said, well, you just have to go with us. So after we got to Haneda Airport on my ninth birthday, that was uh, November 9th, 1946, I said to myself, I'm not going to learn one word of Japanese and I'm not going to play with Japanese children. And then I had my first bike, and six boys followed me. Two were a little bit older, but they followed me. When we saw Japanese children, we would yell and cycle after to scare them. I think we did it two or three times, and then my mother found out. So she had a very long talk with me. She asked me, what do you want to do? Have they come to invade China? I said, no. Have they bullied you uh, here? I said, no. My mom said their parents might have been beaten up or had been put in jail because they were against war. How could you do that? Then I changed. I know that you always have to separate the government and the people. Always, always. And then later on, I know. No, not a single government in this world can 100% represent its people. Like our government, like the Chinese government. Uh, we came back to China in 
1951, in the summer of 1951, because at that time Mao said that the Communist Party would set up a country with freedom, democracy, united front, and rule of law. And then I found that I was asked to be a docile tool. That is, you have, I had to listen to the party. I was a tool, not a human being. The party secretary came to encourage my daddy to put forward criticisms. And he said, we would love to listen to your suggestions. It's not a crime, okay? We will not label you as anything. So my daddy put forward some criticism. And yet right after that, they said that my daddy was attacking the party and socialism. So he was removed from teaching. And then in 1957, that was the year for me to enter university. But after my daddy was labeled as a rightist, I thought I might not be accepted as a university student, as the daughter of a reactionary. And I didn't dare to study very hard because at that time, with my family background, if I had studied very hard, then I would have very good English, then I would have been criticized. So I could be a target. So I didn't dare to study. Then I would do some social work, right? Then in 19, from 1959 to 1960, it was the most difficult period for the people because people didn't have enough to eat, not because of the weather, but because the policies of the Communist Party. So up until now, a lot of the history of certain periods are not disclosed. People are not allowed to know the history. But if people don't know the past, they will not know enough about the present nor the future. So knowing the real history of your country is important. Go and find out. And then in 1966, the so-called Cultural Revolution started. And uh, the Red Guards came to my home and took away everything that belonged to my parents. On that day, my parents were forced to kneel down on the ground. Not flat ground, but with small pebbles. You know how that feel. And they were forced to take off their shoes, and hang on their ears. So they were shamed. They had never been. They had never been to them, and yet they had to suffer. Right? They took us, they took things away from my home, and then they started an exhibition with all the things they took from other families but they all put it under my parents' name. The bourgeois life of Wu Wenzhou and Xie Binxin. And every day my parents were forced to hang a little small blackboard on their neck. And they were forced to stand outside of the exhibition. Anyone could go up and beat them. Because beating people death, to death was revolutionary action. It was awful. People went crazy. So many people had been committed suicide. So many people had been beaten to death. It was awful. So in a way that people like me lived in terror. That was the Cultural Revolution, right? And then I was a reactionary because of my family background and because I wanted to speak up. And then I was forced to tell a lie, saying that the school leader supported the fistfights among students. Actually, he was against it. So they forced me to say he supported it. I refused for a long time. So I went through about 80 
over 80 struggling meetings. I was standing with my head bowed down. And then the students would shout slogans, saying that if I did not disclose the truth, and then I would be something, something. And sometimes I was forced to stay at the student's dormitory. I couldn't go home. And at that time, my son was only a little over two. And when he came home, only stay one night with me, there were nightmares. So my son suffered. They wouldn't let go even a child. So then I told a lie. Then I, actually I felt awful after telling that lie. But then after that I said to myself, I would never, never tell a lie anymore. Because when I was a little girl, my mother only trained me to speak the truth. And that's the most important value I think a person should keep. So uh, like uh, in 1982, I was sent to the United States as a visiting scholar. I was at MIT uh, because those people who had good family background went abroad earlier. I only went in, uh, in the early 80s. So I went to MIT apart from setting on some of the classes. There was a community leaders program. In the United States, the African Americans were fighting for their rights. The Asian Americans, Latinos, Americans, you know, they were all fighting for their rights. And I shared my story of the Cultural Revolution with the people. So when I came back in 1984, it was an election year uh, for people to become a poli local politician. And in that year, the uh, criteria were a woman, middle-aged, I was 47, a non-party member, I'm not a party member, and an excellent teacher. I was an excellent teacher, or oh, I have been an excellent teacher because I love every single student. And my, all my students loved me, right? Then I got elected because all the cooks knew me. And uh, like the dorms mothers knew me. Uh, so I got elected. So in China, I was the first person, first politician to study the Constitution. I want China to be rule of law, not rule of man, by man. I think the best way to have a country is you use one yardstick to measure every single person. Then that's fair, fairness. That's equality. Very often the party encourage the people not to vote for me, but people just voted for me because they think I could represent them, I speak the truth. And that's something I learned from the Cultural Revolution because I did tell a lie so that I would not be struggled against, so that my son would not suffer. So I think you have to learn from your own mistakes. And that's important because I have always been speaking the truth. So uh, they kicked me out from the Beijing Municipal People's Congress in 2007. And then in 2011, they kicked me out uh, from the Haidin District People, People's Congress. So sometimes now it's hard for me to find platforms. Why? Because if people, some leaders would go up to the website and then to check about my uh, background. Some of them are afraid. They said, we could not have Wu Qing. She's a dangerous person. So, but now I'm still looking for platforms. And uh, like recently, I've been to some universities and the students got really inspired. I got a lot of email messages from them. Because I think young people are our future. They have to know enough about the real history. And then they have to make changes. Uh, but they have to learn. Number one is how to protect themselves. Number two is still to try to make changes. 
a step at a time, an inch at a time. Si cambiamos la mirada, haremos que el mundo cambie. Sin nada que perder.